Good morning. So good to see everybody here today. It's great to hear the fellowship that's going on too. Matter of fact, I can hardly quit talking over here to come welcome everybody. I was enjoying fellowship so much. We're just so excited to see everyone here today. All your children are growing up. I tell you, each Christmas and we look at their children and it's just awesome. But thank you so much for coming. Thanks for watching us on Facebook. Those of you who are at home, thanks for inviting us into your home. If you don't mind, go ahead and hit like and share with a friend so that we can reach more people. If you look in the pews in front of you this morning, you should see a Connect card if you would fill that out in its entirety and send it to the center aisles. We have some young men that will collect that for us in just a few minutes. Today, as we um, assemble, last week we announced that anything above budget today that's given will go to the Churches of Christ disaster relief effort. Uh, we have witnessed what they have done so far in western Kentucky, and we're just so pleased with that work. So anything that's given above budget today will go to the disaster relief effort to help those that have struggled from the storms this year. Also, beginning January the 2nd, we're going to host Room in the Inn on Sunday evenings for nine weeks. If you're interested in helping with that, please see Stephen. And also, December 27th here at the building, we're going to have training for that. So we'd like for those who are going to help with this, please come uh, for that training. And then um, hmm. okay. I didn't hear you. Gotcha. Come on up and we'll let's all stand and sing, please. to praise you, but I fall on my knees. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is so weak. Light the fire in my soul, fan the flame. in my heart again. I feel your arms around me as the power of your healing begins. Your spirit moves right through me like a mighty rushing wind. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day. Father, we thank you most importantly for Jesus who died for our many sins. Because it's through him we have salvation. Father, thank you for blessing us each and every day. Thank you for letting us come here to sing praises, worship your name, and hear the lesson today. Father, thank you for our preacher and our youth ministers and everyone here, the deacons and the elders. I know they have to make tough decisions. 
Father, also be with those that were impacted by the storm this last couple weeks ago. Be with their families. Keep them safe and comfort them in their time of need. Be with others, Father, that need your prayer. And also, there again, just keep us safe from harm. And let us always remember that your name comes first. Be with us as we go through this church service today. Let us take something from your word so we can be an example out there to everyone else. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Your only Son, no sin to hide, but you have sent Him from your side to walk upon this guilty side and to become the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O watch me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, your gift of love they crucified, they laughed and scorned him as he died, the humble king. Sacrifice the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to called a Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Um, before I begin, we wanted to let everyone know that next Sunday uh, we will start passing the communion again here in the auditorium and also passing the contribution basket. Um, just like we used to. So there will be no longer available the communion cups out in the foyer. We'll all be doing that inside the auditorium at this time. At this time, I'd like to reflect on that song that Colton just let us in. It's one of my favorites to get us in the mind of taking communion uh, each and every first day of the week. I want to read you this uh, little excerpt of why he is known as, why Jesus is called the Lamb of God. When Jesus is called the Lamb of God in John 1 and 29 and John 1, 36, it is referring to him as the perfect and ultimate sacrifice for sin. 
In order to understand who Christ was and what he did, we must begin with the Old Testament, which contains prophecies concerning the coming of a Christ as a guilt offering in Isaiah 53.10. In fact, the whole sacrificial system established by God in the Old Testament set the stage for the coming of Jesus Christ, who is the perfect sacrifice God would provide as an atonement for the sins of his people, Romans 8 and 3 and Hebrews 10. As we've reflected this moment in time of the Lamb of God and what he meant for us and what he did for us in sacrificing his self upon Calvary's cross, let us go in prayer and thank him for establishing this communion that we can do in his remembrance. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your son and we thank you so much for him giving of his life for our sins. And dear Father, at this moment in time, we partake of this bread, which we're remembrance of Christ's body hanging on Calvary's cross. Him giving up his life for us was the ultimate sacrifice and the love that he showed for us and continues to show for us. And it's through us that we can show how we love him so much and to honor him during this time of remembering his death and burial and resurrection. Thank you again for him being on Calvary's cross. Thank you, Jesus, for doing this for us. Let us partake of this bread and well pleasing man. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Dear Father, now we partake of this cup, which is in remembrance of Christ's blood shed on the Calvary's cross, the blood that was shed for our sins. Dear Father, again, let us reflect upon that day and thank him for everything that he has done for us and continues to do for us. Dear Father, let us reflect on things we know our sins are washed away. But Dear Father, let us reflect and make sure um, we focus upon um, not falling into temptation, not falling into those sins and, and doing doing things that we shouldn't do. Let us remember that ultimate sacrifice and not take advantage of it, but be the servants that we need to be each and every day. Thank you again for washing away our sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I said, next week we'll start passing the basket here in the auditorium, but if you are watching at home on Facebook and unable to join us, you can still um, share of your contribution by those means on a, on a weekly basis, and um, we'll take care of that for you. You can contact us in the office. Again, uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, anything above the contribution this morning, budget contribution will go to our disaster relief um, help for the uh, local communities around us. Let's pray. Dear Father, again, we thank you for this time that we get a chance to pause and think about all the good that you have done for us, the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, and, and everything that, um, that we have, dear Father. But we know everything that we have belongs to you and that we need to give back, give back towards that. And dear Father, we are um, in the giving season and we need to remember that and we need to be thankful of everything you have blessed us with whether it be a toy, whether it be our houses, whether it be our cars, clothes on our back, whatever it is, we're so thankful that we have a means to provide for ourselves. And we think of those around us that are less fortunate of us. We think of those that are, um, are struggling to get back uh, to where they were. And it'll be not only today, not only tomorrow, but way into the future. It takes time to rebuild and, and to... Uh, to come back to a place where you were. And maybe maybe as, maybe some of these people might not get back to that place, but dear Father, whatever means are given through Church of Christ Relief or other, or other organizations or other monies, we just pray that, pray that everyone is um, in blessed, through, blessed through these contributions. Dear Father, just uh, let us remember not only today, like I said, but into the future and not let us forget Dear Father, we also think about our brothers and sisters in Christ across the world over that some of these monies go towards 
that are uh, on our missionary fields. Uh, saw reports from Dale this week about the Philippines getting hit by a tsunami or a, a, a typhoon over there. And some of them have lost their church buildings. And I know money's being raised for that as well that uh, can be helped. We, our brothers and sisters in Christ here in the United States that take care of our missionaries abroad and here in the States, let us remember them during this time as well. Dear Father, we also this uh, contribution be a means to uh, take care of the the mission point here at Franklin and let us uh, make sure that we use this money well, make sure we use it wisely and make sure we uh, spend it on the things that we need to be spending it on and that's growth and continued uh, outreach of your ministry here that we're providing through our church. Thank you again for all that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. The reading this morning um, uh, will be um, from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, uh, through the NIV version. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace from the tolls that by me it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted that are pressing, so showers of great blessings o'er my heart will flow. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly of his golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven's sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven as I walk along, dreaming of the Comrades that so long have gone in a fairer region among the angel throng. They are happy as they sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly drink of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven's sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven tenderly and low till the shadows on me rise and swiftly go. When my heart is weary, when the day is long, sing to me of heaven, sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. 
Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven's sweetest song of all. O beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining afar through shadows dim, giving a light for those who long have gone, and guiding the wise men on their way unto the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawn. Oh, give us thy light to light the way into the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star, the hope of light, guiding the pilgrim through the night. Over the mountain till the break of dawn. And into the light of perfect day, it will give out a lovely ray. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem. Shine upon us until the glory dawn. Oh, give us thy light to light the way into the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star, the hope of rest for the redeemed, the good, the blessed. Yonder in glory when the crown is won. For Jesus is now that star divine, brighter and brighter he will shine. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawn. Oh, give us thy light to light the way into the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. <clears throat> oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, oh, Oh, come, let 
helps when you push the right button, doesn't it? Man, yeah. Before we get started this morning, Jimmy Parker wanted me to tell you how much he appreciated the opportunity to teach to us from the book of James. We appreciate him, too. He had some really good lessons, and we appreciate what he brought to us, and we appreciate, appreciate him and his family and what he means to us. Thank you so much. We appreciate your lesson, and Jerry and others, and Stephen, for what they do to proclaim God's word. We're just so grateful this morning. This past week, all of our grandchildren came to our house, and they spent the night. So, um, we heard there, there were going to be meteor showers that evening, and so we all go outside, and, and so it didn't take very long. We got bored with looking up in the sky, so we started playing hide-and-go-seek. Wonderful game. <laughs> you know... Hide and go seek and kick the can are still two of the best games that you can play, and especially playing with your children. And it was such a, a, a good evening. And, and so I'm looking up at the sky, and I wanted to see a, a meteor shower so so badly, but it was cold, and, and so I, I finally go in the house. But I began thinking, just just thinking a little bit. I wonder how the shepherds were that evening, that cold night out tending sheep. I wonder if they were cold. I wonder what they thought when they saw the star so many miles away, so far, so distant, so weary, so isolated, so divided, so tired, years of waiting, months of waiting, months and months of longing, looking for an answer, looking for hope. And when our light has faded and our anxiety has grown. Can we hear? For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. He's called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel. I wonder if we hear that. He's the path in a world that's lost its way. He, he's the thrill of hope to us who are down or disheartened. He's the light that even darkness bows to. He's what our weary hearts have longed for. He's the sound of hope, conquering all fear. He is God with us. God with us. His name is Emmanuel. Pray with me, please. Father God, we thank you that we can be here together, together, and to recognize Jesus, that you are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. And we celebrate that you came as a helpless baby. You came as a lamb. You gave your life for us as a sacrifice for many. But we are also celebrating in this season that you'll come again. You're, you're going to come again. And when you come again, you're going to put an end to so much of all the, all the suffering, the sorrow, the pain of this world. So would you, Heavenly Father, in these next few moments, fill our hearts with hope. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. On December the 12th, uh, a group of about 35 people went caroling. We had so many, we went in two groups. 
And so we went to different folks and just had the best evening. We, we just enjoyed singing these carols to you. And we went out to, to Miss Davidale's and we were, we were singing to her. And, and Eli was leading our songs. And he would ask, do you have any favorites? Or do you have any that you want to sing? And we'd say, announce a number. And so somebody says number nine. And so we looked at and the name of that song was Oh Holy Night. And so Eli looks at me and goes, Mr. Steve, would you lead this one? <laughs> so I led it. And it must have just been me singing because I didn't hear many others. And when we got through with the song, Payne Arnie goes, we wish you a Merry Christmas. We <laughs> so I must have, must have not a good job, must have not done a good, very, very good job of leading that song that night, but, but we had fun, had a big laugh about it. But tonight, or today, I would like for us to sing that song, Oh Holy Night. It has a very beautiful meaning in it, and we're going to talk about this song for the next few minutes and it is one we don't sing here often. So let's sing that together. I can't see the screen that far, so I'm going to come down amongst you. As Jerry Clower, you say, I'm going to come down here amongst you and we'll sing better. How about that? Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and never pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn fall on your knees oh hear the angel voices oh night When Christ was born, oh, night divine, oh, night, oh, night divine. Thank you. I was reading a story about this song this past week. And in 1870, there was a war going on between France and Germany. It, it was called the Franco-Prussian War. And as the story goes, they were fighting each other in trenches. And on that Christmas Eve, one young man from France stands up and starts singing to the sky. Oh, holy night. Somebody in the German trenches heard him singing and recognized the tune. So they start singing in German. And all of a sudden, you have two groups of men that were enemies singing Oh, holy night together. I, I, I just couldn't hardly believe that. Here, men had lost their lives. Thousands, thousands of men had lost their lives during that war. And to make things worse, typhoid fever killed about as many men at that particular time as was, that was lost in battle. Yet because these two groups sang in unison, O Holy Night, they paused the battle for 24 hours. Isn't that amazing? Calm midst of fighting, all because one soldier stood up and began to sing, Oh, holy night. They were able to get their breath. They were able to eat a meal. 
they were able to find some hope, some joy in the midst of all that despair and death. And when I was reading that story, I thought about us. Here we are 151 years later, and we're wanting the same thing. And so on this particular Christmas season, I think that is something that we all long for. We want to have this moment where we can just catch our breath, where we can experience some hope and joy because we really don't get a break from this when you listen to the news. We, we hear so much discouragement, even though we have a great holiday season. We turn on the news and we're reminded of the struggle and of the pain and of the challenges of life. So we're looking. We're always looking for hope. We're desperate for it. And as I was remembering that song, Oh Holy Night, one of the lyrics that they sang was, A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. I want us to look at that today. The word weary is a pretty good word to describe our present condition that we're living in. I began looking at that word more closely. And I think the definition of the word weary is interesting because it just doesn't mean tired. Sometimes when we talk about being weary, we think, well, I'm just so tired. But I believe the definition goes a little bit further than that. The definition I want, or technical definition, is, is this. It's a resistance to experience anything more out of something. A resistance to experience anything more out of something. I've just simply had enough. You ever hear that? I don't think I can take any more. You ever hear that? I, I, it can't go on much longer, can it? I started strong. I, I was good for a few days, and then it turned into weeks, and now it's months, and now into years, and I've just had enough. I can't take it anymore. I'm just so weary. That's what the word weary talks about. And I believe that sort of describes us as we're living in this world. I'm just weary. I'm weary from being out in public. Have you ever been out in public lately and you need to cough? <laughs> what do you do? I, I can't cough. Sure, don't let, Lord, please don't let me cough. <laughs> and so we've learned how to suppress our cough because we don't want to cough. Somebody will think, he has the COVID. We don't want to be around him, right? He's contagious. But that's the weary world we live in. We're, we're tired of this. We're weary of face masks. We're weary of social distancing. We're weary of division. We're weary of racism. We're weary of politics, politicians. Tired of things not going our way. And, and when we get to that point, we just say, I don't think I can take it any longer. And so again, the other night when I was looking up into that sky and it was so cold and I was thinking, wonder what the shepherds were thinking back then. Oh, holy night. That song that that the poet wrote from reading from Luke chapter 2. I wonder how things were back then. So this morning I would like to read from Luke chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading in verse 8. And if you would this morning, would you stand for the reading of God's word? And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you, and you'll find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. 
And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they'd been told. Please be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. So here were the shepherds. They were watching their flocks. They were watching their flock at night. When the angel voices broke through and they, they had this message of hope. And I love what the song says here. The thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. And so I want to draw some attention, just a few minutes, to the lyrics of this great song. And of course, we've touched this, the weary world rejoices. I was trying to better understand the difference between being weary and being tired. Now, um, our granddaughter has a new phone. So we're going to text. <laughs> we live in a world of texting, right? So I looked up some emojis. Here's an emoji we all know, right? What does this say to us? We're sleepy. This is a sleepy emoji, right? So we'll, we may send this to each other a time or two. And then if you Google the weary emoji, here's what you're going to get. You feel that way before? You see yourself there? Yeah, I think that's how a lot of us feel. But one of the things I want to remind us here is um, the world has always been weary. It didn't just start in 2021. It's always been that way. And so I think we forget that. The minute sin entered the world, it's, it's always been weary. And I, I know sometimes things happen to us and they seem to be worse than, than before, but it doesn't mean it hasn't happened before. It means it's happening somewhere. It may not necessarily be happening to us, but it may be happening to you. If it is, you're weary from it or I'm weary from it. And so we, we certainly have a full understanding of what that face means to us when we see that. I also read an insert from a book called The Atomic Age. It, it was a book written by C.S. Lewis. And he wrote about Christians living in the age of atomic bombs. Now, when I went to school, and, and I know for many of you, you know exactly what I'm... They taught us how to deal with thinking that an atomic bomb was going to hit us at any moment. What we were supposed to do, like hiding under your desk and covering your face where you couldn't see the light, were two big things for us, Right? And if you couldn't read when you started the school, they gave you coloring books so that you could color and, and memorize what you were supposed to do in the event that we were hit with an atomic bomb. You remember when the Bay of Pigs happened? We all got nervous and excited again. That just didn't happen in 1948. But, you know, when, we, when this happened in the 60s, we all got nervous again. And we all had to be recharged and energized on what we were going to do in the event that this happened. Well, he writes about this. I find those words to be interesting. He says, how are we to live in an atomic bomb age? I'm tempted to reply, why, you live as if you would in the 16th century when the plague visited London every year. Or as you would have lived in the Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might have landed and cut your throat any night or as you're already living in in the age of cancer an age of paralysis an age of air raids an age of railway accidents an age of motor accidents in other words he says do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation he says believe me sir or madam you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb ever existed. 
It's perfectly ridiculous, he says, to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world that already bristles with such chances in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. He says this is the first point to be made. And the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we're going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, and sometimes they put pandemic beside it in parentheses, then let the bomb or the virus, when it comes, find us doing something sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends in a game of darts, and not to huddle together like frightened sheep and thinking about COVID or bombs. They may break our bodies, but they need not dominate our minds. So I'm not telling you to ignore the atomic age. I'm not telling you to ignore the pandemic. But what we're trying to say is he's writing about the certainty of uncertainty. And we need to realize that it's true. And it's going to be true in 2022. It was true in 1948. It was true in 1870 when this song was written. When, when this song was sung, it was written earlier. But when the, we live in an age of uncertainty. So we put our hope into something thinking it's going to be okay. And then it doesn't. It doesn't hold up. And we become weary. And the thrill of hope is for everyone who feels weary. The thrill of hope is for everybody that thinks, well, I've just simply had enough. But the thrill of hope, friends, is that Jesus came. And because Jesus came, we can believe his promises. We can put our confidences in him. And because Jesus came, we know that he's coming again. We have hope. He came the first time. He's going to come again. And when he returns, it's not going to be like the first time. The first time he came, he came unnoticed. The first time he came, he came as a lamb. But when he comes again the second time, he's coming as a lion. And when he came the first time, he came in silence. But when he comes again, the, si the, the, the trumpets are going to sound. The heavens are going to roll back as a scroll. When he came the first time, nobody hardly noticed. But when he comes again, everybody's going to notice. Because the Bible tells us that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord. That's why he says, Come unto me, all ye that are weary heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you the opportunity to rest. Isn't that wonderful? And then in the song, we have that phrase, and I love this, that he appeared and the soul felt its worth. That's just beautiful poetry, I think, and it, it, should, it, it should really make us feel good because some of us from time to time struggle with our worth we have trouble finding worth and one of the ways you know that we're having a hard time with finding self-worth is because we suffer from anxiety and worry jesus he connects the dots for us when we look at matthew chapter 5 he says don't worry about tomorrow Tomorrow will worry about itself. And Jesus says to look at the birds in the air. Doesn't the Heavenly Father take care of them? And if he takes care of them, won't he also take care of you? So basically what Jesus is trying to say is, man, look at this. Are you not worth more to me than the birds? When he says what we talked about in class this morning, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. But yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Is, are we not worth more to Jesus than the lilies of the field? 
yet we spend so much time worrying about worth and we struggle with this and we begin to question our place and our value and I think we all have these experiences in life and we have to question our worth from time and maybe it's because of, of some of the things we failed in maybe it's because of something that's been said to us and we just struggle with it all insecurities happen to all kinds of people we'll find phds who are scared to speak up because they don't want to look stupid in some of the things that they say we'll find fitness instruct instructors who work out obsessively because they think they're out of shape we'll find ceos who always have something to prove we'll find those who are the most valuable players of whatever game and they'll complain because they think their game's not what it should be they feel like it's subpar so they work harder but the bible says when jesus came he came as a ransom for many a ransom for many and by doing that it shows our worth and we're worth more to him than any of these silly things that we worry about and we just need to know that the thrill of hope is for those who feel his worth just think about that how awesome that is and if you remember just a few minutes ago when i read from luke chapter 2 this big announcement that was made about the baby jesus coming was made to shepherds and to shepherds back then people didn't consider them to have much worth they 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 were dirty they were smelly they were not clean cut they were not sharp dressed professionals yet our lord chose them to make this announcement to basically i think what he's showing us here is the worth they're worth a lot we're worth a lot and he says i bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people all the people even me even you we should realize our worth and no matter who you are or what you've done or how you look or where you're from, the thrill of hope, the thrill of hope in Jesus is for you. And then there's one last stanza in this song I want us to look at today. He knows our need to our weakness is no stranger. I never really paid much attention to that in this song before that I, I really enjoyed looking at that this week and i want you to consider what he's saying he knows our need to our weakness is no stranger and the thrill of hope is for those who are weary for those who feel worthless and for those that feel weak into our weakness he is no stranger so what that means to us is Jesus knows exactly how we feel. Exactly. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says, Because Jesus is able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, he understands the pain of this world. He knows what it's like to feel hopeless in a world that we live in. That's why he says again in Hebrews chapter 4, We approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need he he understands he has a full understanding he's not a stranger in weakness we don't have to worry about does he care or does he not care and i know some of you need to hear this this question maybe you need to hear this because you know it's the end of the year and you're having trouble making ends meet well, let's remember that our lord didn't have much either he lived in poverty he lived without most of his life maybe some of you are having trouble with family he knows exactly how you feel he had trouble with his family his family didn't believe him at first it took them a long time for them to understand that he's the savior they finally got on board and maybe you've let down by some friends at a time or two when you really need them the most well, he understands how you feel. 
He understands the weakness of this because he had friends that left him when he needed them the most. They turned and they ran. But there's a thrill of hope in knowing that he sits enthroned in heaven and he sees us and he understands us. And as I was working on this message, I was thinking about it. It's hard to capture the thrill of hope that Jesus brings if we haven't experienced some of this in our lifetime. Because we have experienced some of these things, we do have the thrill of hope. And, and it's, it's almost like we put all our weight on, on to something. You know, we have a chair at home. It's an antique desk chair, and it, it has one of the, the rollers that doesn't stay on good. And, and so if you sit down in this thing and you put your weight on it, it will throw you in the floor. I mean, it'll th- <laughs> so fast you don't know what's happened. You ever had a piece of furniture like that? I mean, you'll look up and you're laying on your back going, wow, what happened? Who knocked me Who knocked me out or who knocked me out? Well, that silly chair did this. Well, that's the way we do life. We have something that weighs so heavy on us, and we put all our weight on it. We find ourselves on the floor, but the thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. He knows our need. To our weakness, he is no stranger. He's a constant companion. So when we need to put our weight on something, we can put our weight on him. He'll carry our burdens. He wants to be the light in your darkest day. He wants to be the vision when you can't see through the season that we're in and to have great news of joy. A Savior has been born. Now, I don't know what's going to happen in 2022. If, if, if I had a crystal ball today, I'd probably tell you that it's probably going to be more of the same. <laughs> That's just life. And you know what? There's hope. And the hope that we have in Jesus Christ does not disappoint us. There's a peace that passes all understanding, and we get that through him. And the song that we're going to sing next, I, I, I changed that at the last minute and asked him to sing Silent Night. And I know we don't normally sing that as an invitation song, a hymn of encouragement, but I do want you to see the phrase in this song, All is calm, all is bright. So let's think about those things. And it may not necessarily feel that way in your world, but think about this. It didn't feel that way in Mary and Joseph's world either. After the shepherds came and after they had that announcement and after they came and saw the baby in the manger and they went back, you know, Mary and Joseph had to get up and leave because they were in danger. Our Lord was in danger as a baby. So their world was turned upside down too. But Jesus makes a difference. He is the calm in our chaos. He's the light in our darkness. Pray with me, please. Father God, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your gift of Jesus. And Jesus, I thank you for the fact that you forever established our worth. I pray that we put our hope in you. We find our strength in you. And Father God, I know that I'm talking to some people who are weary. They're tired of getting back up and finding whatever they put their hope in has gotten them knocked out from under them. But I pray today that you'll give them the courage to step out of the trench and hear the song being sang into the night sky that there's hope in you, the thrill of hope. So I pray in these next few minutes that we'd feel a calm, that we'd feel a peace, and that we remember that Jesus is the difference. In your name we pray.
we can help you today. Please come while we stand and sing. Tom comes this morning, and man, we love Tom. He has such a good heart. And he has a heart of a father this morning, and he wanted us to know that the court has awarded custody of Amy's children to their father. And he asked, uh, you know, how can this be? Amy desperately needs your prayers and love, so please pray for her. Flood her with text of love and care. You may not get an answering text, but please continue to lift her up. Decisions are still to be made, and we beg God's interference. And he thanks you for this time. He's also asked that Mike come and offer prayer on behalf of he and his family. Would you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, you are so great. Father, we come to you this morning to just pray for Amy. Amy's weary. Amy doesn't seem much hope right now. 
Haley's lost her vitality and her vigor, and she needs rest. And Father, we just pray that you'll be with us as a church, that we'll all lift up our prayers to Amy. And Father, we know in your word that you say you're the one that can give us rest. And this is going to be our prayer for Amy this morning, that you'll give her rest, that you'll restore her family and restore relationships that need to be restored. Father, we thank you for Tom and a father's heart. And his heart's breaking too. Father, we just ask you to be with us that we'll reach out and do what we can do that we'll learn to love you more, to lean on you more. Father, we know you answer prayers. And this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. We're dismissed, I think, right?